Hey, how's it going? Derek here. Thanks for coming by for uh, interview one of our Closer series. Uh, we're talking to closers from different industries who can give us their tips uh, for how to close deals. Uh, this one's with David Torres. He heads up uh, Latin America uh, for HubSpot. Um, when they opened an office in, in Colombia a couple of years ago, they were only eight people, uh, and now their office there has 150. Um, with uh, millions of dollars in uh, install base for HubSpot software. So definitely a good interview. Hope you get a lot from it. Uh, don't forget as well that uh, if you're an MSP that is looking for more consistency um, around opportunities with uh, businesses in your area, uh, we're getting around six uh, for all of our clients on a monthly basis. Definitely book some time with me and I'd be happy to, uh, to share with you how we're going about that. Anyway, have a great one. Take care. Bye. David, I, I know you well. A lot of no one no one else no one else here knows uh, knows who David Torres is though. So let's just start off, man, by, by you telling us a little bit about you know uh, who you are and, and why you're here today. Um, so my name is David Torres. I am a segment lead for channel sales in Latin America at HubSpot. I started at HubSpot. It was my first let's call it career job out of college. This must have been roughly eight years ago or so. So it's been it's, it's been a minute. Um, and I started selling to North America, prospecting cold. I was an SDR, just dialing for dollars type of thing, trying to <laughs> trying to make sure I could pay my credit card debt, student loans. Um, but I fell in love with what I was doing, and I, and I fell in love with the idea of being the best that I could and putting iterations on my process to get better, sharper every single day. And uh, and it worked out really well for me. I ended up getting promoted rather quickly. Uh, within like nine months, I was I was in a in a closing type role as an account executive. And then beyond that, uh, about a year later, I became a sales manager. And then from then on, I've been leading the growth of Latin America at HubSpot for the past uh, five six years now. And it, it, that's been growing a direct channel growing the channel channel uh for sales uh mm -hmm. I, I got to open the office in, in colombia for for hubspot in bogota that I, when i was there that office was eight people fast forward now it's it's more than 100 individuals uh so so it's been a crazy ride and, and it's been amazing to learn all these different lessons across geographies across different businesses and and for for me it's been an, a, a story of how do i learn how to position value because it's it's about value. It's not about being commoditized, right? When, when we think about technology, it's very easy to start up technology. It's very easy to create functionality. But if you really want to do your best job while you are trying to close, while you are having that those sales conversations, it comes down to how well do you understand? So for me, my, my closer story really is more so than the career stuff. It's It's the ability of learning how I can really understand an individual's business how can I set a frame of reference for the conversation and how can I demonstrate value by being different? Because if, if you're just going to sell the same thing that the person next door is going to sell, you're, you're going to end up in a spot where it comes down to what is your cost per hour? That's too expensive. I don't, and, and it doesn't help mm. anybody. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've recognized along the way is, is the value of, of charging your worth, right? The, the value of, of saying, hey, you know what, customer, it seems like we're not a good fit and that's okay. You live your life, I'm gonna live mine. But really working with people who are committed to overcoming their own challenges, because that's where you got, get great, uh, I'm not gonna call it synergy, because that's very buzzwordy, but you know, I'm gonna use it anyway. That's where you get good synergy and, and that's where it's easy to work with people who wanna work. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and through the years, that's gotten sharper. And, and as we've grown uh, from its tiny install base to now a, a bigger install base, uh, it, it's, it's more relevant every day, especially yeah. coming out of this pandemic. So th that's yeah. a little bit on, on, on my story, uh, but we can, go, we can go deeper. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so I don't know if, who's joined us or if, if, um, if you guys heard, but the company that David Torres is with is HubSpot. Um, maybe just a, a really quick background on like, you know, on HubSpot, uh, not, not, not like a pitch on HubSpot, because I know that's what you're going to do or you, or you can do really well. <laughs> but, um, but, but I think so just for context, like just so they understand a little bit about the, what it really yeah. means for you guys to go to Bogota and, and uh, maybe a little bit on like, you know, the MRR, sort of the amount that you guys are yeah. kind of looking over. So yeah. HubSpot is a software company. So software as a service, uh, it went public in 2014. 
And Which when I joined fun. HubSpot, it was so yeah. much fun. Uh, uh, when I joined HubSpot, I was maybe employee 416, let's call it. And, and, and I remember walking through those being like, wow, I work at a big company, 416 employees. Fast forward today, uh, I should say back then HubSpot was based out of Cambridge, Massachusetts, beautiful Cambridge, Massachusetts, had an office in, in Dublin in Ireland. That was that. Fast forward eight years later, now there's an office in Cambridge, Portsmouth. Uh, there's a satellite office in San Francisco. There's Dublin, there's Paris, there's Germany, there's Singapore, there's Japan, there's uh, Sydney, Australia, and, and Bogota. So, so it's been a company that's been a rocket ship, uh, to use that term, actually, as, as it ought to be used. It's, it's been crazy growth. And what's even more interesting is the way that the company has evolved over time. Because when I joined HubSpot, it was one product that had three flavors. Right? It was marketing software suite. And that's what that was. And it was very much, oh, what else do you do? Marketing software, marketing software. Okay, done. Over the years, the company has expanded its product offering to turn into a platform. So I've gotten to see the evolution of how a business goes to market with a very much a demand generation muscle of, hey, you're a person, I'm a person, let's talk to each other, let's try to sell to each other rather. And, and over time that's turned into, well, now we have a freemium product acquisition. Over time it's turned into, well, now we're actually gonna go up market. So we gotta go back to those cold prospecting skill sets. So it's seeing the, the evolution of a company's go to market and the way that uh, you as a salesperson or as a sales leader uh, pivot and adapt and, and, and face the new challenges and, and get your team pointing their energy in the same direction so you can move the needle faster. Uh, that's really what, what's been HubSpot for me. And, and that's the, the sales school that I've gone, gone to grow up in. It's essentially a, a company that's evolved over time where you have to understand the new dynamics of the market, the new personas you're selling to, understanding how you position value from the CEO to the CCO, to the operations manager, to the sales director, sales VP, and now the services counterpart, and, and understanding how you, you understand their roles, their challenges, what's frustrating for them, and through that, draw a parallel with your product and your service offering. And, and that's mm -hmm. where you really get to become the best salesperson you can be is through that evolution. Uh, and, and HubSpot provided that platform for me. Mm -hmm. I, absolutely, man. I, I started working with, with David um, when I had early on in my days at HubSpot. And man, it's just so amazing to see how much, this, how much you've grown, how much the company's grown. You guys just keep going. Um, awesome. So I guess I want what I want to try to do is, is try to pick pick apart the 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 best the best from your from your experiences in in managing a really really good tight knit high close sales process yeah um so moving on here a little bit to um i guess sort of like your closer journey if if you will like you said that you started off as like a as like a, a bdr or so yeah. like co prospecting and then you and then you got promoted to account executive for closing and then you be, so you became responsible for closing deals like people to buy that marketing software mm -hmm. how, how when when you first started um how, how did how did you approach closing uh deals maybe in like in your first you know like from so what you remember at there the are beginning. yeah there are two people that won't ever know this but they were <laughs> fundamental in shaping my sales career okay the first one's a gentleman by the name of Chris Giles, and he used to be the CEO of a logistics broker company in Canada. And uh, I cold called Chris. And this is maybe me about two months into the role, right? And mm -hmm. I was drinking from the fountain, you know, I was I was buying into the the, the inbound methodology, the software. Someone would yeah. call this guy, I'm gonna tell him all the things that he needs to do right. These are all the things that's broken. Here's my case study that proves that I'm right. Yeah. I call on my good friend Chris, and he looks at me and goes, I know that company you're referencing. I do three extra revenue. Why do I need this? And it hit me like a ton of bricks. Like there, guys, <laughs> I can't. I, I'm getting goosebumps right now thinking about that moment. And then he goes, "I am a cold calling rock star. I don't need." And 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 what he did in that moment was shed light on something that I was fundamentally missing, mm. which was this idea that the world is successful independent of me. Mm. And I was trying to pitch or to convince. And as time has gone on, I, I've, I've really more bought into this idea that it's impossible to convince anyone of anything, right? You can't do it. If someone doesn't mm. want to change, they don't want to. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, but, but when Chris said, I do 3X the revenue, why would I ever need this? I really, 
the moment for me, that watershed moment was understanding that I can't be so arrogant to assume that my way is the only way because it's mm. not right. There are so many different ways that a business can solve challenges. And my solution is a solution. It's not the solution. Right. There's, there's definitely efficiency gains. There's definitely a value prop behind it, but I can't be so arrogant as to assume that without me, you're not going to be successful because there's companies that are. Mm -hmm. So I went home that night and I scratched my head and, and, and it was like a tiny little, little, little seed that was planted and, and I didn't really know what to do with it, but as time came on or as time went on, I started rethinking the way that I was showing value to my prospects. And this is where I embraced the more difficult route. And it's really important that if you want to be the absolute best salesperson you can be, you recognize that sales is difficult, but you have to embrace the fact that it's difficult and doing things the hard way will always pay off more than trying to do things the fast way. Mm. And, and and there's a there's a neat parallel where where Muhammad Ali used to say your your training camp is hard so the fight is easy, hmm. and there's there's an element to that to it because when when you're selling it's very easy to think here's my hammer where's your nail and I know you got nails just tell me where the nails are I'm gonna hammer, mm -hmm. but when you do that, what you're really telling your prospect is hey everything before me didn't exist, everything before me utterly useless and it really devalues the fact that you have this other person in front of you who's been able to build something quite amazing on their own. Right, without and you. you can't dismiss that, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So for me, understanding that element was, was, was crucial and then thinking, okay, how, how do I think beyond this challenge? Because I recognize that if Chris is being successful in spite of me, <laughs> so are other people. Therefore, I need to understand what makes him successful and then understand where those limitations come in play. Mm -hmm. And that's really where things evolve. And that means rather than thinking to yourself, how do I get my prospect and drag them into my world mm. where I'm trying to prove the ROI and the efficiency gains and all these things? All the how case do I end studies. Yeah. yeah, all those mm -hmm. case studies. How do I find my way into their business to understand the mechanisms through which they operate and the reach that those mechanisms can have, but as well as the constraint that those mechanisms can have? Mm. And this taught me to think about every single business that I was potentially selling to across like uh, variables of how they go to market, how they de generate demand, how they drive their install base to go forward. And if I was able to do those things, then I was going to be in a position where I could present value because I understood the limitations of the different strategies that a business might have. Mm -hmm. And that is something mm -hmm. that was so different than what I was doing at first. Because at okay. first, Eric, my thought process was, sorry, I did my discovery call. For my discovery call, you said yes to the demo. You said yes to the demos and I'm gonna present pricing. I'm gonna send you the proposal and in my CRM, I'm updating all the stages and my CRM says we should be at a closing stage. So, hey, Derek, let's close now. And you're like, they don't wanna buy. I'm like, what do you mean you don't wanna buy? I did my steps. I did the demo. Yeah. I handled your objections. I sent the proposal. What were you supposed to close? Why aren't you closing? Yeah. And it was like, this does not compute in my head of what am I doing wrong? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. it got frustrating for me. But again, I, it was, I was coming from it from a viewpoint of I'm doing my thing. How come you're not doing yours? Mm -hmm. And the second that I understood, hey, success can happen independent of you, everything mm. flipped on its head. Because then my sales process changed. And rather than being in a position where I was just checking the boxes on my CRM, I turned into really having an honest conversation with another individual where I was looking to understand first and I got to see my value as a salesperson, not as a function of the things that I knew about my product, mm. but as my ability to learn about my prospect. Okay, so let me ask you something here. So yeah. you said that you you were doing like discovery and then like the demo, and then that that was like the playbook either handed to you by your manager or like what you thought was the right one, and then you had you got like punched in the face, and now you learned this lesson. But like what action, so how did you apply your lesson learned into say like your discovery calls after you got punched in, after this, this thing changed? What did you so actually change in your discovery? The, the CRM yeah. process didn't change, right? It was still okay. uh, uh, discovery that like those That's, mechanisms. You still have to discover. Sure. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what I started to do differently was my mm -hmm. discovery was built off of what are your goals, Derek? You want to grow? I'm going to help you grow. Let's grow together. Happy days. Ah, okay. But I That's realized. you did it before. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's how, yeah. that's what I was doing before. before. But when uh -huh. I, what I recognized is that nothing can live in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. Nothing in life lives in a vacuum. 
And when an individual, or like just to use a simple analogy here, when you're driving and you're making a right-hand turn, you're making a conscious decision to make a right-hand turn. You're also making an unconscious decision to not go straight, to not make a left, and to mm -hmm. not go backwards. Right. And so everything that you do- An opportunity cost, right? Exactly. You to go there, not the other, other directions. Exactly. Yep. And similar things happen in businesses. So when I was doing discovery, it evolved from what are your goals? Let's help you get there to, hey, independent of your goals, what's frustrating? What's difficult mm -hmm. about what you do? Because what I recognized was that challenges are far more tangible than goals. Like if you ask somebody, and I've, I've done this exercise a few times with different people, what I say, hey, what's one thing that you wish was uh, better about your day? And I've started to count the seconds without them paying attention. And, and typically it's around 30 seconds before I get an answer. But when then I ask, and what's frustrating about your day? It takes about 10 seconds to get an answer, right? Because <laughs> challenges are so much more palpable. They're so much more tangible. They're the things that you're like, oh, I wish X thing like, would stop. And understanding that was a bigger driver of urgency than trying to get to where you are. Mm. So my discovery process changed to under fundamentally understand like five things. A, do you have a problem? Because if you don't mm -hmm. have a problem, then it's about what you could do, what you could potentially be doing. But the problem, Derek, when, when banking off of goals, it's like we mm -hmm. all have goals in our personal life. And I always use this one because it's, I think somebody can relate. Right but this that. idea of like diet, right? Everyone's like, oh, I want to be healthier. I'm going to go on a diet. And that's mm -hmm. a goal that a lot of people have. Mm -hmm. The problem is we all know what a good diet looks like. <laughs> right. It's not right? like rockets. It's like you eat less and yeah. you, uh, maybe you should you exercise, exercise more. at the same time. Exactly. There you go. <laughs> it's so simple, but the fact that it's so easy, simple, though. Yeah. It's, that's what makes it so much more difficult because yeah. this is what ends up happening. You're like, you know what? I do want to eat better, oh, but my fiance just bought that really good brioche that I love. So you mm. know what? I'm going to wait my mm. diet until I go to the grocery <laughs> store next and I'll wait uh -huh. next week. And then yeah. next week, something else will happen. We'll be like, oh, but we got ice cream from our neighbors. Okay, I'll just wait another week. It's because our goals, while important, aren't necessarily immediate game changers. Or, or we don't know what it's like to live in that realm once you achieve your goal, unless you've done that previously. And mm -hmm. that leap is something that's so difficult to, to actually feel. Mm -hmm. Whereas the challenges are something that punch you in the face every single day. So when I'm doing discovery now rather than being like, so what are your goals? What are the things that you can't do right now? It really started with this idea of what is the problem that you have? Do you have a problem? And if mm -hmm. you do have a problem, let's, let's bake that thoroughly because mm -hmm. nothing lives in a vacuum. So if you're telling me that X is a problem, X needs to be impacting other things. What are they impacting? And what I was mm -hmm. really trying to understand is how do I make the most out of my time as a salesperson? Because the mm -hmm. reality is, Derek, imagine I have 10 people. I consider myself a pretty good sales rep. I was number one in North America and Latin America my year in the funnel. Um, and this is across all markets. So I consider myself to be a good sales rep, but I'm not the best salesperson in the world. And even if I was, if I have 10 people in front of me, there's people that are not going to buy because a mm -hmm. good sales, like a close rate, let's say 30%, that mm -hmm. means out of 10 people, seven will not buy. Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. you're trying to convince people mm. that they need to buy from you, you end up in a position where you're kind of putting all your eggs in one basket mm -hmm. rather than making the most of the time that you have. Mm -hmm. And you this is a really, you kind of attach yourself too, right? Cause like, yeah. you feel bad if you lose it. Cause like you felt like, well, I'm supposed to close everyone. But then if you're not as attached, you can have a more genuine conversation, which I think the prospect can feel that you're not really trying to pressure them into anything. Which helps. But anyway, yeah, it's, it's just something that, yeah, go on. Sorry to interrupt. Well, but, but you're spot on because yeah. that idea of desperation lives in my world as a salesperson. It's in the, right. my, my prospects completely independent of that. So we go mm -hmm. back to this theme of you can't assume that you are the superhero in their mm. story, mm. right? Mm -hmm. In their story, mm -hmm. they're the superhero. You're just a blip in the radar, right. you know? And I can't assume that I'm the superhero for everyone I meet. So when I was thinking about my new sales process, the way I was doing discovery, it turned into, okay, so if you have a problem, let's really bake out what that problem looks like. And that leads me to the second piece of my discovery is, do you recognize that you have a problem? Because mm. right? we all know people and you're like, hey, you probably should curb these spending habits. They're like, no, 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 it's fine. I'll just get another credit card. Okay, like, hey, you live your life. Good luck with that, bud. Right, mm -hmm. but that happens in our lives, in our, in our daily personal lives. It's gonna happen in our work life too. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding, does my prospect have a problem? Do they recognize it as such? Because mm -hmm. if they don't recognize that that problem has impacts, it has consequences, there's other right. areas, then mm -hmm. it's all a moot point. So yeah, so, I was going to say, like, how, how do you go from like, 
what are your what are your challenges to knowing if they rec so I imagine when you ask that question, what are your challenges or frustrations? And then if they're able to answer, how does it impact me? And they give you a I imagine that that's how you knew that they recognized it. Because if they didn't have a good impact, then I guess you could illustrate it for them. It's like, but yeah, sorry, like how did you know, I guess, um, if they were recognizing it well enough? And how and when they didn't, like were you did you just kind of quit? Or did you say, all right, now I have to just try to show them? Like, how did you manage that? This is where storytelling is incredibly helpful because this is the okay. cool thing about understanding your industry and knowing it really well. Mm. Mm -hmm. Remember I said I opted to do things the more difficult way? For me, doing mm. things the more mm -hmm. difficult way meant if I'm selling to an industry, I need to understand how the industry behaves. I need to understand where they draw cash flow, where they draw lump sums, where they how they manage their debt to cash ratios. I needed to understand all these things because there are variables that are that, that are non-deniable. If I'm, I'm working with the, let's call it a real estate developer, I mm -hmm. know for a fact that for them, it's they're seeing their business as a financial product where there's an investor in the back end saying, hey, how quickly are you going to get my money back? And mm. there's a pressure of how quickly they can take that initial investment and start to get some liquidity behind it. That's independent of marketing, independent of sales, independent of services. Like that's the core function of that industry. Me learning that took a minute, but... It was the reason I was able to then have a better, let's call it smarter conversation with that anybody in that industry. Mm. And that's the cool thing about mm. being an expert in what you do, because then I can say, hey, typically when a company like yours mentions XYZ challenge, it also impacts ABC. Tell me about that. Mm. And I can set that story up where I'm teeing it up for my prospect to carry the baton and just keep running with it. I'm keep not talking. Just have exactly. Talk, 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 talk. Yeah. And these are prompts yeah. where I'm building the let's call it the outline of how their business operates. And then once I understand that this is an issue, let's find the, the, the proof, the evidence. I kind of went back to my liberal arts background and in college where I was like, if I'm going to write an essay, I need my, my thesis statement and I need evidence that backs it up. So for every mm. sales process, I treated it like research. This is my thesis that this is what's broken. Now give me evidence that backs it up. And when I wasn't mm. able to have evidence, I'd say, okay, so it actually seems like nothing's wrong, which is good. Live mm -hmm. your life, I'm going to live mine. And mm -hmm. then every now and then you get people, yeah, but I'm still interested. In my head, still interested <laughs> like, means maybe one day if, if the stars uh, align uh, and I light the, the candle and I say my prayer, maybe uh, they'll buy from me. Uh -huh, HubSpot is shiny. And beautiful. Yeah. yeah. And I don't want to bet yeah, yeah. my career, my, my life goals, my debt on somebody maybe choosing to one day opt buy from me. So yep. what, what I needed to do was understand if I had somebody that was willing to make a change. Um, actually, a lot of this probably are concepts that I borrowed uh, from, from Jill Conrad. Because one of the things that she does incredibly well whenever she talks or whenever she writes is talk about breaking status quo. When, mm. when we look at our world, we're so obsessed with what the competition is doing. But when I'm being pragmatic, Derek, I don't lose to competition. I don't, I don't say it out of arrogance. It's just kind of a fact. Most of my deals are lost to people that th would rather do nothing. So mm, if mm -hmm. I'm looking to make the biggest increases in my closing, why am I going to focus on this tiny percentage of deals that I lose to competition versus focusing and putting energy to my biggest competitor, which is this idea of I would rather do nothing than make a change. So mm. that's why do you have a problem and do you recognize it as such became so important for me because that is mm. how I was able to break status quo. Now, there might have been competition. I don't care because rather than comparing feature against feature, I'm getting beyond what the competition is doing and I'm really understanding how this business operates. And that's yep. how I'm able to be different. My third okay. question now became, and this was a philosophical question that only you can answer when you look yourself in the mirror and is, can I actually help them? Right. right. And if right. the answer is no, that's that. Yeah. Right. Because again, let's go back to that idea of opportunity cost. There's 10 people. I know three of them are going to buy. Mm -hmm. So if I can't figure out who are the three within this 10, I am wasting my time. Mm. But the sooner I figure out who are the three people that are going to buy out of this 10, the more successful I'm going to be. So when mm. I got this idea of, hey, can I help them? The answer is no. You know what? You're not one of my three. You go mm. living your life. I'm going to live mine. Mm. Because I didn't want to be in a position where I'm putting all this energy, care, and love into this process. Now I'm really committed to it. Now I really needed to close. And then yeah. I get desperate. 
And that's yeah. when, even if I convince the prospect to buy from me, it means I discounted heavily. It means my margins are not going to work for me and it's money in and money out, especially in the services business. You know? yep. So that idea mm -hmm. of, can I help them is really, really key for my process. The mm -hmm. fourth thing is, do they want my help? Mm -hmm. Right. Cause those are, those are two different things. I might be able to help, but if they don't want my help, then it's really a moot point, which kind of goes back to that idea of, do they recognize a problem as a problem? If they mm -hmm. hadn't before and they do now, well, do they want help? If they mm -hmm. hadn't before, they still don't, they don't want help. So mm -hmm. it was, it was a matter how, how of- would you, How would you kind of know at the end if they wanted your help? Like, how would you ask that? Would you just be like, okay, so I understand the problem or the challenges, the impact. Um, what was the third thing? I'm, I'm blanking right now. It was- um, The consequences in different areas. Um, but, but then it yeah. turned into this. It turned into me being a mirror, right? Because mm. things are as they are, not the way you want them to be. Things mm -hmm. are as they are. So mm -hmm. then my entire process became, hey, Derek, this is what I'm seeing. Are you seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? Because if we're mm -hmm. both seeing the same thing, is it worth it for you to make a decision or, or, or make a change? You can see mm -hmm. like, I have some solutions that might be able to help you, but let's be pragmatic. Are you willing to actually put energy against it before we can talk about what I'm able to do for you? Mm -hmm. And that's where mm -hmm. I would understand that I have somebody that's committed to making a change. Seriously. And then it came yeah. down to me making sure that budget was there, that the authority was there, that the timing was right. Mm -hmm. but that's where my discovery really changed. Okay. Wow. Yeah, no, it's, it does. Um, even though I didn't hear a whole lot about your early discovery, but oh, it makes so a lot of sense. <laughs> all the things that you were doing. Uh, uh, my uh, early discovery it. was, Hey, <laughs> so my name is David. Tell me about your business. Cool. So tell me about what do you do for generate leads? Oh, you do that to generate <laughs> leads. Do you want more leads? Do you want more leads? Right? Okay. So if you want more leads, you got to use a blog and put a CTA and use a bot. Yeah, cool. So right since you want tactic. more leads, let's yeah. talk about pricing. This is what it's going to cost you to get more leads. Do you want more leads? Like, and I look back at myself, I'm like, David, who's going to say no to, do you want more leads? Mm. Like everybody's going to want more leads. But, but you know, what's, what's, what's fascinating to me is that like you got taught by HubSpot or by a manager. I don't even know who it was, right? Some, that, for, that thing you just described. And as I know, that's how it was. That's how the discovery was, was mandated. So, I mean, it's, I guess, but every company is like, you know, HubSpot didn't have all the answers. The managers don't have all, I mean, it's, it, it's kind of personalized to you and you made it your own, but even as, you know, uh, you know, companies and managers, they're all trying to figure out the best way to adapt, you know, textbook sales process to, to um, what they're selling. So, you know, that's, uh, that, that's just interesting to me because well, where we're me, coming from. Yeah. The, the pivot that I made wasn't because I needed to, because I was looking down at a plan or I was going to get fired or anything. That pivot for me came thanks to my friend, Chris Giles, again, who fundamentally changed my life. Um, but that pivot for me came because I recognized that if I was going to be the best that I could be, I needed to do what the best did. Mm. And when you see someone who's incredible at sales, who has 40 years of experience, this is what they're doing. Mm -hmm. So I asked myself, right, David, so you got, you got two choices. You can continue doing what you're doing, or you know what the dream state looks like. Just do that. Like, yeah, just be at the dream state already. Like if you don't have to suffer, why are you doing, why are you suffering through it? You yeah. know? Um, and, and that was my big, big game changer. Because ultimately, Derek, independent of, of, of the methodology, whatever, sales is sales. Yeah. And sales is going to be a job. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to do my job and I'm do it to the best of my ability. Right? So yeah, independent I, I of my, what peers yeah. were doing, it came mm -hmm. down to me looking at myself in the mirror and saying, this is, these are the things that I want for myself. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. hey, just a, a couple more questions. I, I know you, you got to head off to, to work, <laughs> start the day. But uh, you mentioned then like, and then you would get into like budget authority and stakes. So can yeah. you talk to us like the next steps? Um, and if, if, if it's possible for you to share like, kind of like you did you know, a few minutes ago, like this is how I was supposed to do that. And, huh. uh, and, then, and then this is how I actually learned how to do it <laughs> the right way. I if, think if that's the way to- I was so yeah. attached, er, earlier on, earlier on my, my deals, I was so attached to not being looked at as expensive. Mm -hmm. Like I was so attached to that, mm -hmm. that it really hurt me because I put myself in a position where talking money just felt so naturally uncomfortable for me that, uh, that I just squirmed at it. And then I wouldn't bring it up on the first call. I bring it up two calls in three calls in. And by now I've invested like two hours into this three hours then to hear oh, it's so expensive. I'm like, well, we can talk about discount and like immediate. Right. Mm -hmm. And it end, ended up with a lot of, like I described in the beginning, well, we're at the closing stage. Why aren't you closing? Like that's what it <laughs> turned into. 
Yeah. When I started thinking about this and, and changing my approach, I re recognized that budget is only uncomfortable if you make it uncomfortable. Mm. Right. Cause he asked me, Hey David, do you have enough money right now to buy a brand new Tesla model S? The answer is no. Right. It's just going to be like, it's just a no. And it was just as simple yeah. as that. It took 30 seconds or it took three seconds for you to ask the question. It took me a split second to answer. Mm. So why am I making things a bigger deal than they have to be? Mm. You know, and that's where my asking for a budget and asking where that budget would come from became a part of the last thing that I do on that first discovery call. Because oh, if I don't so do you that, do you're on discovery call. I would do it right. at the end of the discovery call. Because if mm -hmm. I didn't do it at the end of the discovery call, I was, again, putting myself in a position where the sales process was going to drag on. They mm -hmm. weren't going to have budget anyway. Mm -hmm. And th there are things that I can do when it comes to moving interest. Like I can ask you questions. I can story tell. I can showcase that. There are things that I can do to move the needle on urgency and interest. Mm. I cannot move the needle on whether or not you have budget for this or not. I can mm -hmm. help you find budget and allocate budget. But if mm -hmm. fundamentally speaking, you do not have budget for this, that's what am it. I going to try to do? Try to squeeze water from a stone? Like yeah, that's, a, exactly. that's just silly. It's, it's a silly proposition for me to, to, to try to take on. Mm -hmm. So for, for me, um, Asking about budget earlier on was a complete game changer. Because it mm -hmm. put me in a position where if the person said, oh, you know what? Not what I was expecting. We'd have to see what we can do. Okay. I got someone that's willing to work with me. Mm -hmm. If someone was like, oh, David, that just doesn't seem likely. That's cool. Mm -hmm. You know what? Let, let me send you some resources. You live your life. I'm going to live mine. Yep. Now, where this starts sounding romantic, because it does sound romantic to a certain extent, but this starts sounding romantic when you don't have enough opportunities. And then part of me, my evolution as a, as a closer, if you will, was recognizing that opportunity creation was the name of the game. The mm. more opportunities I had, the mm. better off I was going to be. Right. Because it gave me, quote unquote, the luxury to say no. To say no to some of them. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was okay that people were telling me they didn't have budget because like every place that I didn't have budget, I was able to move forward. And then what I ended up doing was creating a long tail of pipeline. Because six mm. months later, I call this the get lucky on purpose play, where you say, hey, Derek, we were speaking a few months ago. Do you remember what we stopped talking? Yeah, yeah, back then I didn't have budget, but actually, and then our sales process just came back to life. So it wasn't mm. like a no forever. If there's mm -hmm. value, there's value. If you had a problem, you recognize you had a problem, I could help you, you recognize that you wanted my help. But if budget was the only thing that was missing, that's okay, life goes on. We can always mm. come back to it in the future. Mm -hmm. And that was so liberating for me too, because mm. then getting to a no, just, it stopped, I stopped beating myself up for a prospect not having budget. Yeah. yeah. You know? And that's yeah. sometimes we hear you like, how dare you not have budget prospect and now it's my <laughs> fault. You know, no, it's, it's just, that's life. Yeah. But when you recognize yeah. it, it's that you're able to move on and that creates opportunity for the future. And I think mm -hmm. that's a big mistake. A lot of salespeople make earlier on, they start thinking to themselves, oh, if I don't close it is because I am bad at my job. No, it just means that you're not investing your time wisely because I do believe anybody can sell. I do believe mm. anybody has what it takes to get better at sales. You do have to be committed to getting better, but it's doable. If I can do it, anybody can do it. But it's an element of, of recognizing that decision point and figuring out what are you going to do about it. Yep. Man, this is great stuff. Uh, who, else is, who else do we have in here? Oh, we have a, actually have a few other folks that have joined here. Let me just stop, stop sharing. Uh, uh, I don't even know what you guys are seeing right now. I'm so new to Crowdcast. Click to close message. Hover here to hide. Here, one sec. Sorry there you go. so blatantly um, disrupt your flow. Yeah, and and to, to Alan's point, that idea of recognizing that other people are the superhero in their, their story, I think it's so key because when you're a salesperson, you kind of get accustomed to my product, my service, what I do. It's so great. Look at my times. Look at my SLAs. And we start building this narrative around all the things that we could do for the prospect and we stop listening. So that mm -hmm. idea goes hand in hand with this concept of your values as a sales individual isn't what you know, it's what you're able to learn. If you mm -hmm. can learn, think of yourself like a dam of water, right? A dam of water captures all this water and then channels something that's actually digestible for the town or for the energy. That, that's my job, I, I'm the dam. My job is to collect mm -hmm. all this water information, understand all, this, this, all these things that might be happening. And it could be a tiny little blip and it could be this mm. thing that the person mentioned, I'm just going to put it in my back pocket. And as the conversation unfolds, I start channeling the things that I've heard to present value. But my job mm -hmm. is to learn. I got to learn, mm -hmm. learn, learn. That's the real value of a salesperson. 
So again, don't be so arrogant as to assume that you're going to step into their world and all of a sudden you're going to be like, you're the superhero I've been waiting for. And that's not right. the case. Right. Seldom right, is right. that the case. That's going to happen every now and then, but it's seldom. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's such great advice. I'm going to have to go back and, and uh, listen to the whole recording again. And um, But man, thanks so much. It's so good catching up catching up with you. Um, before I let you go, one, one other question that um, I, I wonder if maybe you could shed a little bit of light on. Um, because HubSpot has a tremendous marketing engine too. Sure. And I imagine um, that you know, some of the cases for those companies that went, that said, I don't have budget now, but then you circle back later, like some of those companies, they may have been getting marketed to like, what would you say? I mean, and I don't know if you know this, like what percentage of your deals that closed, would you say were ones where, were people that um, were getting the continuous sort of marketing from HubSpot in the interim versus ones that like, you know, weren't being, you know, continuously getting the touch, touch points from HubSpot in some form or another. Like, do you have any insight uh, into I, that? Not at the top of my head, and I can't give you like a clear step, but I know for a fact it happens because here's the whole thing about data, a database, right? And um, Eric Yuan, I believe, is the one that said it. he's the CEO of Zoom, but he goes, businesses will struggle for one of two reasons. The first reason which you can do nothing about is you have a product that has absolutely no market. <laughs> there's nothing to do, right? You have a product, but there's no market for it. You're done. The real reason most businesses will struggle is because they're not efficient at going to market. And this idea of efficiency is what's so key because a lot of businesses say to themselves, I want marketing qualified leads. I want the best. Well, so do I. So does everybody. But we have to get better at recognizing that idea of a, of a marketing qualified lead or a qualified lead in general is really a function of two things, fit and interest. And when those two elements combine, that's when you have a, a, a real quality lead, when you have fit and you have interest at a certain window of time. So I guess three variables, right? Fit, interest, and timing. But so just because it doesn't happen all at once, it doesn't mean it's never going to happen. Mm. So when you look at your database as a business, you, you really have to get cognizant and recognize there's a certain percentage of business that deserves love today, right now, because they're fitting that fit, interest, and timing. Then there's going to be that, a certain portion of your database that's going to be a high fit, but a very low interest. I'm okay with that because my job is to create interest. Right. That's where my mm. research comes. That's where doing it mm -hmm. the hard way comes in. Right. Doing the right. research, understanding how they operate, asking interviews with your best customers, understanding how their margins go, how their cash flow works, how they think about those things, cost or expenses, hiring ahead of th those elements. Mm. Then you have this percentage of database that's going to be high interest, low fit. I call that like mm -hmm. the real long-term pipeline because things yeah. evolve over time. Yeah, they might be too, a single person. Yeah, they're not ready for by HubSpot yet. You can't exactly, yet, but, they, but yeah. they might go to another business or they might actually grow themselves. So you always got to consider there's a percentage of that database that's worth understanding that it's not opportunity for today, but it will be six months from now. And right. then there's a certain percentage of that database that's just not worth your time. Simple as that. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about how you become more efficient and more scalable in sales, it's really understanding what bucket do you spend your time and how much time do you spend within that bucket? Mm. So for me, of course, there's opportunities that I had myself that now my sales reps are closing. And I'll be like, I remember that opportunity. And they'll be like, yeah. <laughs> way back when. <laughs> exactly. And I love it when it happens because I tend to have a pretty good memory. So I'm like, yeah. oh, is it? They're like, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I tried to sell them to them back in 2015. They're like, what? Wow, six years. years. He's involved. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and this is oh. where understanding that, again, it's, it's a function of those three elements. Because here's the other thing that salespeople do, Derek, that, that I find just a little cringy is when they're like, oh, I guess it's not the right time. And you get all snarky about it, right? Oh, I guess you don't want to grow. It's like, well, that's not the case. That's not the case. Yeah. Stop being snarky. Sure. It's yeah. not. It's Who doesn't not like want it, more sales right now? Right? It's not like right? the prospects yeah. can be like, oh, because you yeah. said those things, now, now I'm going to show you. Like, it, yeah. life's not like that. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a real importance in making sure you do nurture your database. There's a real importance in making sure you do have more content because this database that you have isn't going to evolve on its own. Right. You They're need not gonna, to help it so like, I'm thinking about that, that example you just gave, like six years ago. Like, I'm sure you were really good in that call six years ago, but I don't think you were that good. No. <laughs> it, it was all that marketing that HubSpot continuously yeah. does like all over the place. It's like that. It's like the continuous David Torres touch, but like HubSpot, 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 HubSpot. All right, I have the money now. Or, or think it. about it kind of, yeah. kind of like this. You're in a position where you need to incentivize 
that emotion. You need to incentivize folks to do something. Like my database isn't just going to tell me which quadrant each individual is in because I'm like, hey, can you guys help me out? Can you help me understand where, where? that's it doesn't work like that. <laughs> Let me check the box, right? Yeah, right. Do yeah. you check the box for me? Uh, are you looking <laughs> yeah. to buy today? Please buy today. Yeah. It yeah. seems like you're my long term opportunity. When you do that. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. But when you do have things like a blog, when you are doing things like automated workflows and you're hosting webinars and you're putting together podcasts, you're incentivizing interaction from your database. Mm. And through that incentivizing of behavior, you can bet, get better clarity as to who's in what quadrant and how you invest your time wisely. So yeah. that idea of, hey, today is not the right time, but it might be in the future. That just means that I got to keep incentivizing your behavior to come back to me. And that right. happens through value added content. It's not yeah. going to happen because I'm saying, look at my new features. It's not going to happen because I'm like, look at my new services. It's going to happen if I can deliver value to you as a person, as an individual, independent of our business transaction. So yeah, mm -hmm. to answer your question, mm -hmm. super important. Awesome. Yeah. No, man. Good stuff. Uh, man, it's so good to see you. So good you to catch well. up. And this was really helpful. Uh, I did see one question come through from Alan. He said, what if they ask pricing at the start? Did you ever get into a discovery call and be like, all right, David, how much does HubSpot cost? All the <laughs> right? time. People just like, how did, you, oh. how, how did you handle that? You have to embrace it head on because think of like every individual carries a certain level of anxiety. I call it the anxiety meter. Like I carry it, you carry it. Alan, I'm assuming you carry it. Like we all carry a certain level of anxiety meter. And there's nothing worse when your anxiety meter is up here and the salesperson is not answering your question, right? Don't shy away from it. So if you ask me, hey, David, how much do you charge? Uh, Derek, we typically, uh, customers like yours are usually investing anywhere between like $10,000 to $20,000 a year. That's a wide range I'm going to use right now because I don't know enough about you, but I'd like to understand mm -hmm. a little bit more. Typically, businesses, mm -hmm. if they struggle with XYZ, can you tell me a little more about how you're handling it? So now we're playing hot go. potato where I answered your question, but now I'm tossing that hot potato right back. Right back but at yeah, you. Good. Take it straight on. Don't shy yeah. away from it. Yep. Good question, Alan. Thank you. All right, David. Well, hey, have a great weekend. And you as well. uh, maybe if you're up for it in the future, maybe we'll have, uh, have you on again if, if you're yeah, up for it. Yeah, if there's yeah. other questions, happy to answer them at another time. All righty. Awesome. All Take right. care, Derek. See you. Thanks, Bye, Steve. everybody.